So a 100-year-old business um, seemingly fails overnight. Now, what happened? Um, it was one decision, but the decision was based on a series of events and people who were in a position to make the decision. And as you all know, a business is a tangle of interpersonal relationships. I wish Dr. Schwartz, or as she was called last night, Dr. Pepper, was, which is a different thing. We're here to, to comment further because it's all, in many cases, about personal relationships. If you don't have a good relationship with your bank, when the problem comes, you're going to have a worse time dealing with the bank. If you don't have a good relationship with your suppliers, which I think is something we'll talk about on the panel that follows us after lunch, um, because GM also had some issues with its suppliers, as did Chrysler. Um, it's your customers, and all of, and it's your employees, and all of these come together when you're making a decision, for example, to move your main facility in the United States. So before Binks was a clear decision to leave its union, and it chose to move its facility, key facility that made its key product from Chicago, where it had been built for since its invention, to Longmont, Colorado. Now, I've never heard of Colorado being a low-cost area for production, but it was near some ski resorts, which a few of the executives of the company uh, like, to, like to frequent. Um, so into Longmont goes the company's signature product to be built by new employees with new suppliers um, in a new facility with no testing of the facility before it goes live. Um, now you say to yourself, how can this happen in the United States? In this case, it was 1998. Well, it does, and it happens over and over again. And the human comedy is forever, and people will make poor decisions uh, for lots of reasons. In this case, um, for every spray gun Binks was able to ship, it threw away three. Um, yeah, that's not a good, that's not even close to six sigmas. So um, Binks was unable to ship its key product. Um, and there was a reason, but no one figured it out until you know, it was too late. And the reason was the plans and specs on which these products were built um, and were built in Chicago were not exactly correct. Uh, and they really didn't reflect the product. And all of that knowledge was in the head of the union employees who remained in Chicago because they didn't continue to update their plans and specs. They knew what needed to be done to assemble the products, and the, and the suppliers knew what needed to be done uh, to tweak the old plans and specs. So when it got out to Colorado, the suppliers made what was in the plan and spec, and likewise, the employees built it uh, according to the, um, the bill of materials, but it didn't fit together. So that decision, let's move to a lower cost area to produce, good decision, execution, Horrible. Result, within 90 days, the board is gone. Um, the banks continue to finance the company. We engage an investment banker, William Blair, in Chicago. And the US company, which is the biggest part of the, of the business, is sold to Illinois Tool Works, which makes the key decision which Banks was unable to make because it was too insular, which was to look at its product line and decide that 80% of its products were worthless, and 20% made all the profit. Where have we heard this before? Uh, it's the old 80-20 rule, right? And um, fire some customers, because some customers, like Sherwin-Williams, were costing them money. Illinois Tool Works overnight turned a big division. It had uh, sales, I don't know, 150 million, into a smaller one of 80 million, but a loser into a profitable company. Well, they made the same product, but Binks didn't have the intelligence, structure, management oversight, I think we've seen these phrases up on, on the board, to do it themselves. So let someone else do it. They let their acquirer do it. And as a result, the equity got wiped out. Binks went into bankruptcy, basically, uh, in, in the second and third step after the ITW sale. And uh, 
you can buy a Binks gun today. Um, it's now owned by Graco. It keeps on going into different uh, companies. But the name continues, but the people are all gone. So the takeaway for me in that case was when you make your decision, do a lot of due diligence from the private equity lens. Think hard and carefully. Maybe bring in outside people. The Binks bringing in an outsider was bringing in your cousin. I mean, if, if your last name wasn't the family name, they really didn't want you there. And so someone said, bring in all the Africans, bring in all the Asians. Don't be so insular. Broaden your base. Um, get smart. So I think that's some examples of things. Now, Schwinn is another wonderful case. Uh, Schwinn is an iconic name. Anybody have a Schwinn bicycle when they were growing up? You bet. Um, those of us who couldn't afford it had Raleigh's, at least on the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I got to Chicago, I, I'm a New Yorker by, uh, by birth, in 1970. Uh, Schwinn was an iconic brand then. I mean, everybody wanted a Schwinn bicycle if you were a kid. Um, when I got to Schwinn in a professional way in, uh, in 2000, um, Schwinn was a different company. Schwinn was, interestingly enough, managed or um, instructed by, I will call it a medieval code. It had a, it was a, in the form of a trust, and the trust required that the president of the company be from a certain lineage within the Schwinn family, and male. I mean, I, in the 20th century, you see these things? Well, Schwinn had it. So it fell to Ed Schwinn, who happened to fit all those uh, biological characteristics, to run the company. And Ed was not a dummy. Uh, Ed saw, as did Binks, that manufacturing bikes in Chicago probably didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, unionized, but also uh, in, a, in an old building, so modernized. So he went to Mississippi. He moved production to Mississippi, again, to a new factory, which had never built bikes. And he outsourced to China, to Shenzhen. When, and he was a pioneer doing that. And he also went behind the Iron Curtain as soon as the wall fell. So he went to Hungary, uh, to Budapest, to build bike frames. Um, it all sounds good, except that um, since Ed was the family representative and the board were family members, this is once again a company of insularity um, with a big brand and actually not such big revenues. So uh, Ed's mistake and the board's mistake was uh, twofold. First, they went low cost. They went to China. And it was a perfect move, except they made a, two mistakes there. They didn't protect their technology. And this is before people said, Chinese steal your technology. They just let them have it they, because they owned a piece of giant bicycle. So uh, on, both in Shenzhen and on, ta on Taiwan, where giant was, and China bikes in China, uh, they were also producing bicycles, and they were producing Schwinn's on the same line that they produced the Giant and they produced the uh, China Bikes bike. And uh, they were the same bikes, basically. So they sold into the Schwinn dealer network in the US. Um, the components were made by Shimano and others. And uh, the Schwinn family didn't think to protect their dealer network. And as a result, their suppliers became their competitors, and ultimately, the folks who, in the bankruptcy, refused to ship bicycles to Schwinn. So um, in Mississippi, on the other hand, uh, no one had made bikes before. And uh, dealers refused to accept bikes made by the Mississippi factory because wheels would fall off, a few things like that, or brakes wouldn't work. Schwinn was one of the first bicycle companies to have a giant recall uh, of the braking system, sort of a precursor to the automotive industry. So. Schwinn was ultimately sold to a private equity group, uh, the Zell Chilmark Fund. It did well with it. You know, some private equity firms have a long-term perspective, and some have a short-term. This one had a relatively short-term perspective, so it flipped it three or four years later. Um, and at, by that time, Schwinn had become a distributor. It outsourced all its production. Um, it had a better name. And uh, so the name continues today. It's now owned by yet another company, 
uh, a Montreal Canadian based company uh, that makes baby buggies, but uh, you can find Schwinn bicycles everywhere, except the family is long gone. The employees in Chicago are long gone. And, um, and Schwinn is another case of a, an interesting decision and foresight moving to low cost areas um, that went wrong. One of Ed's problems with these low cost areas, <laughs> Hungary was, if you crossed Ed Schwinn, he banished you. He was like the king. So all the Hungarian managers were people that he didn't like. They shipped over to uh, across the pond to run the Hungarian company. And the Hungarians knew very well how to deal with, with Ed Schwinn uh, people. Uh, they feed him beer and pastries and park him. And so the managers of the uh, Hungarian factory were uh, often, uh, let's say, out to lunch. So there's a story of another company, American company, an icon, that uh, did well for a long time and then met its Waterloo, couldn't fix itself, and its suppliers killed it. And then there's Ace Baking, which was brought ultimately by Interbake. Um, Ace Baking was a wonderful little company based in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It made ice cream cones. Um, and it also supplied the chocolate taco to um, uh, Good Humor. Uh, Ace was consistently profitable, but hired a president who decided that growth was the way to go. And you know, growth is crucial. On the other hand, you can bite off more than you can chew. Again, it gets back to management. Uh, you can manage one location, now try managing six. So what Ace did was they bought Five or six of Sweetheart's location, Sweetheart Cup, um, which also made uh, ice cream cones, and they became the largest ice cream cone supplier manufactured in the United States, made one billion cones. And that summer when Ace had its problems, uh, the United States, no joke, almost faced an ice cream cone crisis. Baskin Robbins almost ran out of ice cream cones. Um, because, by the way, you make cones in the winter not in the summer, you just don't have capacity to run your machines to make the cones in the summertime. So in Ace Baking's case, uh, a family business uh, reaches too far, doesn't do its due diligence, doesn't understand how to consolidate six plants um, in six disparate geographic locations. Great idea, poor execution, and the result is a uh, in this case, a bankruptcy, I'll call it a restructuring, really, kind of like GM, and a new owner, Interbake, which is a very large Canadian company. So the ACE model still, label still exists. It's owned by different people. Good ideas, bad execution, poor management. Um, the owner of the company actually spent most of his time dove hunting in Costa Rica, so he didn't much, much care. And that's you know an interesting theme. It came up earlier yesterday. You have a founder. Founders usually have visions. Um, sometimes the founder falters, and if you don't have a strong management team below, you have a real problem. Or the founder um, is no longer right size for his business because it's gotten too big for him. So in the case of Ace, it was the former that the founder kind of lost interest, and he didn't have a bench of people who could step up. Um, I've seen other cases where the founder just was unable to, to run it. In fact, it reminds me of sort of the last example I want to give you, which is a Canadian company called Skyreach. Skyreach was based in Edmonton, and it had a wonderful business selling industrial products into the oil sands companies out of Edmonton. Um, it was entrepreneurial driven, and one guy ran the, sh ran the show. He's deceased at this point, uh, Barry Weaver. Uh, Barry found that uh, it was a the perfect moment for expansion, and it was. It was 2000 and to, um, and he raised a bunch of money from General GE, and he raised a bunch of money from a sub-debt fund in Toronto. And just as he was about to put the money into his business, uh, Barry got sidetracked. Barry decided that what really was important was to buy the naming rights for the Edmonton Oilers Stadium. So it became Skyreach Stadium. And then for you Canadians in the audience, you'll appreciate this. Calgary days, Barry thought that an even better form of publicity for the company would be to um, fund and sponsor a couple of chuck wagon teams. And apparently in Calgary, anyone from Canada here? Okay. So I'm told, I've never been, that uh, they have these chuck wagon races 
in which horses die and truck wagons fall over and people get killed and, and it's apparently a grand time and uh, is it true? <laughs> but it's also maybe a bad way to spend your money. So Barry diverted all, all of the funds to kind of ego uh, ingratiating um, opportunities. Uh, today, the, by the way, the stadium in Edmonton is called Rexall, right? And uh, someone else is sponsoring the truck wagons. So it was a beautiful company. It was poised exactly when the oil sands were gearing up hot and heavy, and he had domination all over the place, and he just lost track, and there was no bench below him. So as you think about your management teams and your strengths, and I know succession is often a big, big issue for privately held companies, whether you're global or not, um, it's really important that your second tier be better than you are. Okay. Yeah.